There are nine days, formally speaking, until pitchers and catchers report and have their first workout in Bradenton. Good morning to you. Good Monday morning. I'm Dayan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. And on that upbeat note... This is Daily Shot of Pirates. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or hockey. I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Penguins where you found this. I'm looking forward to, you know, the way I've set this up, three separate trips I'm making to the Gulf Coast of Florida to cover baseball. Uh, Anyone who knows me knows I am no fan of being anywhere near, much less in Florida, Me and that particular state have not gotten along well over the years. But for this, I make an exception. Not once, not twice, but possibly thrice. Is thrice the right word? Thrice, thrice. Yeah. In the interim, I want to put together a week-long series this week that looks at each of the various positional groups and where the team is heading into the 2023 season. And there's no better place to start than the starting pitching. And for what it's worth, I happen to see this right now, and I'm open to changing my mind on this as the circumstances change, as the strength of the roster. I really do. I know that sounds crazy. Uh, I know it might sound a little bit... uh, Overly optimistic, but I don't really come with that particular bone when it comes to covering the three teams in Pittsburgh. I I, I really try to avoid that sort of sentiment in either direction, you know, pessimistic or optimistic. This just looks like it could work. And I felt that way before Rich Hill was signed to the one-year $8 million deal. Hill is just an undying lefty, and I know that's redundant. Because those guys pitch till forever. But what he brings, uh, the smarts, the guile, and you know he's got enough stuff, especially the off-speed stuff, to keep hitters off his fastball, uh, to keep them uh, off-balance, off-timed. And I think he can become a really valuable component to this rotation and really to this team. I'm not a big fan in any setting, including a pure, complete rebuild, which the Pirates themselves acknowledge they're no longer in, of having just a bunch of kids in a rotation. There's too much advice that needs to be traded. There's uh, way too much to put on a pitching coach's plate. And just by having that guy, even if he's not super talkative or whatever, which Hill, by the way, is, You have someone that you can watch. The Pirates became really, really big fans. The players did. In successive years of Tyler Anderson and of Jose Quintana. And that's not an accident. Both of those guys had very different personalities, but similarly professional approaches. And they did rub off on the younger guys. Ask any of them, but most notably, Mitch Keller and JT Brubaker. They really appreciated it. Now, for the rest of the rotation, the part that might seem like the one that would be the biggest strike against any kind of positive outlook, it probably shouldn't be. Look at who they've got and look at their trajectory over the course of the past season. Look at the 2022 that Mitch Keller had. Look at the improvement that he showed as a pitcher. Not just as a thrower, not just doing the stuff that had everyone excited around this time last year when Mitch was throwing 102 miles an hour in some North Carolina pitching factory. This is different because Mitch became a pitcher over the course of the year. He got really, really smart. He actually was always really smart, and he wasn't afraid. He wasn't nibbling. He just had never really put it together. Until the better part of this past season, I might be as excited about watching Keller's next step as I am about watching O'Neill Cruz next step. And I don't have a higher level of anticipation for this type of stuff. There's, there's nothing I can put up there with watching these two guys just rise up. 
But not far below on that same list, I'd have to put Rowanzi Contreras. And I'm guessing that you're not any different. So right off the bat, we're talking about three guys. I mean, Hill, you're not, you know, Hill's not going to progress. Okay. But you've got a guy that you know is steady. You know he's coming from the left side of the mound. So that helps the rotation overall. That helps the manager's ability to structure a lineup, keep the other team from getting too comfortable within the same series and all that other stuff that's been true for 150 years. But between Keller and Contreras, you've got two guys that you have reason to be hopeful about, as opposed to just being hopeful. Like, I can say that about Johan Oviedo. I can say, look, there was some stuff that we saw late in the season from Oviedo where you can say, wow, this guy can really do some things. A little bit of inconsistency after the trade from St. Louis, but you can see why the Cardinals had him up. And why, even though they had more than enough to fill out their rotation, they still had him on their staff on a contender. This guy can pitch, and he just might be someone who makes it up into that same bracket. Brubaker's a tougher case to make. Uh, JT, you almost have to be extra and possibly unfairly selective about which stats you look at, which ones you find to be real, which ones you don't. The big, gigantic, enormous asterisk on the back of his baseball card is always the home runs. He kind of cut those down last year. Uh, he had stretches where he'd still you know, get get knocked around a little bit. But for the most part, he found some of his own shortcomings and addressed them. And in a couple of cases, a couple of issues that he had specifically, he did so emphatically. And yeah, it was a little unfortunate that he he ended up getting shelved for part of September. He was able to battle his way back and he felt good about that. I actually talked to him for quite a while on the last day of the season. And he feels like he's in a good place. The Pirates feel like he's in a good place. Look, all he's got to do is be the fourth or fifth best starter in this rotation because it won't be long until Luis Ortiz makes his way into Pittsburgh. Ortiz, I am telling you, I have the sneaky feeling about this, could just come into Bradenton and floor people, and everyone's going to be saying, and I'll probably end up being one of them, that he should make it up to Pittsburgh and call him up right away, or you're not serious, or I'll bring up the punting thing again. <laughs> here's what here's what you're going to have, is he's going to go down no matter what. And he, honestly, in a lucid moment, I'll tell you, that's actually going to be the right thing in his case. He's pitched very, very, very little above the double A level, but my goodness, you saw it. You saw what he did when he came up. Uh, this kid has a chance to be special. And between these guys that I just mentioned to you, Quinn Priester being one level away, Mike Burrows being one level away, starting pitching isn't just knocking on the door anymore. When we come back, J1Q. This portion of Daily Shot of Pirates is brought to you by our friends at North Shore Tavern that's directly across Federal Street from PNC Park. It's home of Steak on a Stone, an eating experience, underscoring the word experience. The steak is brought to you partially cooked on an 800 degree stone and you do the rest. It's a ton of fun, it's a great meal, and it's a baseball atmosphere like no other in Pittsburgh. North Shore Tavern, right across Federal Street from PNC Park. Today's J1Q comes from Bob, who says, Hi DK, first, thanks so much for your daily podcast. I try to listen to them every day, though I must admit that I am particularly partial to the Pirates. I say this all the time, the Pirates get the lowest numbers of the three. But I always find it funny, the number of comments that come in 
on the Pirates one, wherever it is that we have comments, predominantly on the DK Pittsburgh Sports website and app, but also on YouTube and other places versus the other two teams. It's almost like Pirates fans like you want to make really, really sure that everybody knows you still exist. I'm very much aware of this. Rest of Bob's question here, actually the Actual Bob question is, is Derek Shelton an effective manager? I have to say that after three years of him at the helm, I still have no strong opinion of him one way or another. And I'm guessing that's because he's not had much to work with. Regardless, I still don't have a a, a feel for whether he's the right person to lead the Bucks to the next level. You know, Bob, this is going to be one of the more compelling questions of the coming season, and it won't be one that we talk about until opening day. And I'm not talking about me and you. I'm talking about anybody anywhere because spring training and grapefruit ball and all that stuff doesn't mean anything, obviously. But the manager is something that always kind of stays in the background as a, you know, as a topic until there's a game and until he does something wrong or he brings in uh, uh, the wrong reliever or he yanks out his starter at the wrong time. It's almost always something related to pitching changes. I have a feeling that you and I are both going to think that Shelton is a better manager this year, if only for what I just talked about in the opening segment. A manager who has a starting rotation is going to look like a smarter manager because he's not forced then into more of those types of decisions that can backfire, and by the way, do backfire on everyone. If a manager brings in anybody other than Dwayne Underwood Jr. in a tough situation, and that anyone other than Dwayne Underwood Jr. gives up a bomb, It's not really on the manager. Now, if you are the manager who brings in Dwayne Underwood Jr. and he gives up the bomb, it's entirely on you as the manager, and you probably should consider submitting your resignation. But I digress. No, seriously, he's he's not had the chance. I don't have an opinion. I've had certain thoughts at certain times. And if you've been a regular listener to this show, you'll know that I'll get pretty impassioned on those thoughts in game settings where it looked like he was every bit as comfortable as Ben Charrington was in just forfeiting certain situations by using whichever Josh Van Meter of the week they'd brought in as a waiver guy in some important role where you wondered, what will he ever look like? What will he ever feel like when he's a manager who's supposed to be winning the game right in front of him? That's what I want to see. That's what I want to see from him. How does he handle a situation where, you know, it, it's slipping away a little bit and you got to you gotta do something as a manager. You got to make him a bold move, maybe a little earlier than you're used to, maybe a little later than you're used to, depending on the situation. I keep going back to that game in Los Angeles, part of the sweep at Dodger Stadium, where Shelton is in that dugout, and you can tell, you can tell from looking at him that he's feeling what the players are feeling. They have a chance to do something really, really cool in taking out the highest paid team in the game. And the team that's got Mookie Betts and all these other guys all over the field. And he had to react accordingly. And he had David Bednar go 50 pitches. And apparently, according to Shelton himself, wasn't going to go 51. He had to get it done when he did. And to his credit, he did. But it was the manager who recognized, even though Shelton had had Bednar out there for the eighth, that he was going to have him out there to finish it off as well. It was feeding off his players. It was feeding off the moment, and it was prioritizing winning the game. I'm not making this out to be the norm. Believe you me, and you know this, that was the exception. But we need to see a lot more of that. Not risking pitchers' health and that sort of thing. I'm just talking about prioritizing the victory that's there to be had in the moment 
I appreciate the question. Good stuff. I appreciate everyone listening to Daily Shot of Pirates. We'll do another one of these tomorrow. Mm-hmm.